Ladies and gentlemen, the bond market is disagreeing vehemently with the Federal Reserve. The bond market, not maybe in the nominal level where it's at, but the spread, but the spread between the long-term and the short-term bond yields. We're going to talk about it with Jeff Snyder, the head of global research at Alhambra Investments. Jeff, on the 26th of January, you wrote an article that updated us on where spreads lie heading into rate hikes. I think that's going to be the biggest part of this story is where are we? We haven't even started raising rates yet. Presumably this the spread will tighten even further, maybe. I'm giving away the whole story. Jeff, where should we start with this whole idea about the yield curve, the spread between different tenors? Where should we start? Well, let's start with the Fed, right? I mean, the Fed is raising rates. It's tapering its QE. QE is on track to be eliminated by March. The expectation is in the meeting that was held this week on Wednesday, every indication suggested that the first rate hike will begin at the March meeting. So very shortly, that's going to happen. Why? Why, Jeff? Why are they doing Fed this? Fed believes that inflation pressures have risen for two primary factors that we've, we've discussed at length before, but briefly we'll go over them again. Number one is expectation. So the Fed oh. said last year's inflationary pressures were transitory. Believe it or not, they actually still believe that. But what, they th what they're worried about is that as CPI rates went higher than they expected and continue to accelerate into the end of last year, they're worried that consumers and businesses are going to normalize to those high rates of CPIs, change their expectations. Expect inflation expectations are going to become unanchored from the low rates that had prevailed uh, for the last long while and that they're going to re-anchor at some high level. So the Fed needs to step in before that happens. And the second part of that is the old Phillips curve. According to the unemployment rate, the labor market's getting tight, which means companies are going to be competing for workers, which means of course, labor shortage, high wages, which that means uh, high costs are going to be absorbed by these businesses that they're going to pass along to consumers in the, in the form of consumer price increases. And so you've got late wage pressures, the Phillips curve to go along with expectations. And Jay Powell and the Fed are panicking into rate hikes and tapering QE and balance sheet uh, runoffs and all sorts of other things. Jeff, do you know when inflation expectations became part of the one of the one of the arrows in the quiver for central banks. When did they think, aha, we've got to manage what people are thinking? Because what did it work at that time? I know the audience that has watched this show before, they've heard us mention that there's been a, a paper that recently came out and said inflation expectations of consumers and actual inflation, there's no basis to it. Why are we still believing in this? Did it ever work a long time ago? Maybe like the Phillips curve maybe worked a long time ago? No, and expectations, really, we could do a whole show on expectations. It goes back to Robert Lucas and rational expectations versus adaptive expectation. Econometrics, you know, basically economists looking for a mathematical way to describe the economy came up with this whole expectations thing that eventually became inflation expectations down the road. So it's a very complicated history, but the short answer is no. <laughs> there was never okay. a time when specifically inflation expect where you could explain changes in consumer prices be because of consumer psychology or some kind of expectations component. It was yeah, really trying to reverse engineer what had happened, given the fact that central banks aren't central banks and they have no, no insight into the monetary system. As we know, inflation is always a monetary phenomenon, so... How else can you explain what happened when you don't have any monetary background? And what they stumbled across was this theory that consumer expectations, maybe that contributes to the way consumer prices behave when that particular Fed researcher, Jeremy Rudd, said, why do we believe this? There's never been any evidence for it. And the answer is because central banks don't do money. They don't have anything else to really hang their theoretical hat on. I like that, how you said psychology, consumer psychology. I think that's a better description than consumer expectations, which sounds like perhaps there's a forecast, an outlook, some rational considerations. Psychology, I think, is a better, more apt description of what we're doing here. And you know how tenuous a grasp we have on mass psychology and pff, what that's going to drive? Nothing. Okay. With the Phillips curve. Okay. I can see how that would work. Jeff, are they clued into the fact that the Phillips curve may not work when the labor force participation rate is 
at historic lows, well, historic, you know, uh, post women's liberation, women entering the workforce, that sort of low. Yeah, we have a participation problem. They're obviously aware of the participation problem, but they've spent the last, you know, dozen years trying to explain it in any way that isn't macro related. In other words, lazy Americans, drug addicted Americans. And by the way, this is not just a U.S. problem. This is a global problem. But obviously, the Federal Reserve doesn't care about the fact that it's a global problem. They only care about the U.S. So they've tried to explain away the labor force participation problem, which led them to all sorts of errors and mistakes just three years ago when we went through all of these same discussions. We went through all these all the same situations where the Fed reliant heavily on the unemployment rate, the Phillips curve, all that stuff made error after error, which the market attempted to correct in real time with the central bankers just dismissed. They held on to the Phillips curve. They held on to the low unemployment rate. They started to worry about inflation expectations when none of those things were actually legitimate indications or legitimate representations of what was actually going on in the real economy. So they're aware of these things, but as they showed in 2018, they were incapable of learning from their errors. So the they are gung-ho. They're going to raise short-term rates. And the markets say that they're going to raise them four or so times uh, before they might turn around. I can't believe it. But that is pushing up the short-term, short-tenor yields because these well, remember, are money. Neil, let's, yes, you know, the bond market is all about probabilities. It's not about, hey, this is what we expect to happen. We take these things literally. With short-term yields rising, the market's not saying we're, we expect this number of rate hikes to come along. What the market is saying is the probability is there could be more, there could be a few less, but generally speaking, some range where you know short-term interest rates are around this level. This is what we expect. So there could be a few more, there could be a few less, but by and large, we expect the Fed to, to start hiking rates and to get somewhat into that rate hike cycle. How far it goes, so. that's really how far it goes in terms of time as well as how, far, how high in, in terms of where the rates actually settle, that's what we're really talking about here. But even then, you know, probability distributions, the, the, the short end of the yield curve says, yeah, the Fed is likely to get into a rate hike cycle. How far it goes, that's really the question. And why, if it doesn't go very far, why isn't it going very far? That's really probably the primary question. To see all the graphs that paint this picture, go to the 26th of January 2022 at Alhambra Investments and look for after today's FOMC yield curve is already as flat as it was in March 2018 without a single rate hike yet. So Jeff, tell us it's very flat right now and then what do you expect to happen once they start hiking rates? Well, let's start with what didn't happen. We didn't have the taper tantrum. We didn't have the taper celebration, right? The long end of the, okay, the short end of the yield curve has said, in all probabilities, the Fed's going to start hiking rates in 2022. The long end of the yield curve didn't respond favorably to that projection. Because if it had, it would say, oh, the Fed is hiking rates because of the reasons the Fed stated. Growth and inflation expectations are rising. Inflationary pressures are going up. Therefore, we would expect that to be reflected in higher nominal long-term yields as well as short-term yields. The curve should steepen. Long-term rates should rise faster than short-term rates because the Fed's always behind the curve anyway. So we should see a massive sell-off in long-term end of the yield curve. That would be the, consistent with the, the expectations we were told last year for, for a taper tantrum, which isn't really a tantrum, as you pointed out, Emil, and you coined the term taper celebration because that would be a good thing. If the, long, if the yield curve steepened and long-term rates were rising, we would be celebrating that because that would mean the, the bond market agrees with the Fed that we're going back into at least some kind of normalcy. Because as we talked about in a previous episode, three criteria of evaluating the yield curve, the first one is low nominal level, closer to a Japanese scenario than not. So steepening out from where we are here, the long end should have agreed with the short end if the long end agreed with the premise behind the short end rate hikes. And so that's where we get into the lack of taper tantrum, lack of taper celebration, which is a very striking and starkly important reminder that something's not right here. The long end is resisting, vehemently resisting to the point that the short end prices rate hikes, the long end prices the opposite scenario from why there will be rate hikes. And the result is these two very separate interest rate regimes collide in the middle and the yield curve flattens out at an already low nominal level, which 
strongly indicates no increase in growth or inflation expectations whatsoever. In fact, there's an increasingly downside pessimistic scenario or probabilities that are developing with the, the, the flatter the yield curve goes. What might happen if they do start raising rates? I guess I can't really ask that to you fairly because it has so many considerations, right? Uh, maybe things will improve. Maybe things will not improve with the economic outlook. But do you, do you yeah, want to answer the that? The probabilities, right? The, law, the, the short end says the probabilities are there's nothing imminent on the horizon that will prevent Jay Powell from hiking rates at least a couple times. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many, but for the foreseeable future, Powell's got a clear path to hike rates. In fact, that mm -hmm. was one of the reasons why short-term rates have risen so much in January because previously last year the fed had said numerous times the only thing that's going to stop us is another variant the pandemic so when omicron came along late november early december the short term rates were kind of you know the short term part of the market was like okay maybe this will prevent powell from hiking rates but by january when it became clear omicron was not going to be as big of a deal as everybody thought powell was absolutely there was nothing going to stop the fed from hiking rates which has been reflected in the steepening of only the short end of the yield curve. But as I just said, it didn't convince the rest of the yield curve to go along with it. In fact, ever since then, the yield curve has flattened out even more dramatically, which suggests the bond market, again, probabilities, the scenarios that are embedded in the flattening yield curve are all downside probabilities. And we don't know what that means specifically right now, but the chances are that something happens that does interrupt the Fed at some point, like 2018, where they don't get as far as they want, the inflation pressures don't happen in the way they, they thought they would unfold. And in fact, the economy develops along a very different path than the one forecasted by the FOMC. That's what the back end, the flattening yield curve is actually telling us, that the Fed thinks it's gonna do one thing because the economy is gonna go one way, when balance of probabilities are going in the other way again. So the short term is saying, we don't see a recession imminently. Right. Things are fair enough. But the long term is saying we see depressed economic activity At some and point. well, I mean, depressed indefinitely. Right. And we don't see any sort of booming economy, rip roaring economy. And so now we're going to be in this sort of doldrums to see if something changes for the better or for the worse as to whether or not we can get out of right. the Japanification. Let's, let's our criteria number one again. You know, the yield curve is flattening out here where the 10 year is below 2%. The 30 year mm -hmm. is barely above 2%. So we're getting this taper rejection where nominal yields aren't even anywhere like they were in 2018. You know, the 10 year got above 3%. So the market is already reevaluating these probabilities at an already lower nominal overall level than just three years ago when it didn't work out very well for the Fed or the economy to begin with. So, what does that tell you about what the market is actually suggesting? in terms of probabilities for not just inflation, but not just longer run inflation potential or growth potential, but also maybe the intermediate term. So even if the short end doesn't see any imminent problem that would prevent uh, the FOMC from a couple rate hikes this year, the long end is pretty vehement that at some point, the, the balance of probabilities are so unfavorable, it's not gonna get very far. The market thinks that all this is a bunch of theater by the FOMC, right? They're not saying, these rate hikes are going to trigger something. They're going to cause something to break. This is very important what the Fed is doing. That's not what they're saying at all. It's just, here's what the Fed thinks they're doing and why they think they're doing it. And it's narrative, but we're not, a, we're not assigning some sort of fundamental importance or consequence to that. Is that right? Yes, this is not a policy error. The market is rejecting the premise behind rate hikes, not the consequences of the rate hikes. The policy error, what may, you know, everybody who is taught from economics know 101 that the Federal Reserve is central to everything and everything flows through the Fed. Therefore, if something bad happens, then it must be because the Fed caused it. Right. The policy error, like was tried to, like it was attempted to be applied to the 2018 2019 case, was the Fed hiked rates too far, and that's what caused. The downturn, which is just ridiculously absurd. You're telling me that, you know, what was it, two and a half percent federal funds range caused a global downturn? No, After that's not how the years. world works. That's just basically trying to assign the Fed a role it doesn't have. And you're absolutely right, Emil. And I think I'm, I'm glad you pointed this, you wanted to point this out. It's that the bond market is bond market is not saying, oh, the Fed's gonna hike too hard, too far, 
too quickly and that's going to cause a downturn. Mm. The bond market is saying, I reject the premise behind the rate hikes to begin with. The Fed thinks that growth and inflation are going to be better or higher in the, in the intermediate and longer term. The bond market says, no, they're not, regardless of what the Fed does along the way. That's it for me, Jeff. Any final thoughts? Anything that we didn't raise during our three little talks here that you've written in the last week that you wanted to bring up to our attention? I think that, you know, when you put all of these things together, what we're really saying is that, again, the first half of 2021 was an anomaly. And there's any number, I mean, there's very obvious reasons for that's why that was why the case. And you look at where the bond market in particular started to doubt the inflation narrative, it was right while it was happening. You know, the long end of the yield curve really started to flatten out, especially after Fedwire, which, you know, we've been discussing for almost a year now. We're coming up on the anniversary of Fedwire, which was a monetary event and a very, very powerful reminder of a fragile monetary system. So again, balance of probabilities, the yield curve started to flatten out while we were in that anomaly, which said that market probabilities were forecasting nothing but errors and interruptions and, and negative probabilities along the way. And that's kind of how it's gone ever since then, even though it's a slow process. You know, we talk about transitory inflation. I think most people, when they hear the word temporary transitory, they think, well, a couple of weeks, a couple, a couple of months at the most, when in macroeconomic time, it could be a year. Transitory, temporary could be as long as it has been. And again, the market has told us all along what to expect, even though the economy doesn't fall off like a, uh, you know, you know, like an absolute crash, like uh, most people perceive of, you know, in, in, in 2008, for example, balance of evidence and data and market prices and everything else, they're showing us consistently that very slowly we're creeping, this growth scare, the slowdown, moving away from the anomaly, leaving us to question, as you raised earlier in this segment, what does the economy really look like once we get past all of this other artificial stuff from last year? And the market so far is answering, it doesn't look all that great to begin with. It looks like 2019, but worse. Yeah, maybe. And that's, there's, that's right. The, the, the downside scenarios are developing from there. All right, Jeff. I loved it. I'll talk to you again, not next week. We have to take a break next week. But thereafter, we're going to be back. We're going to be back so hard, Jeff. People are going to be sick of us. So a lot more content coming, ladies and gentlemen. But we're going to take one week off after this show and then rip roaring coming back hard yes i'm looking forward to it emil so take care you too <laughs>